So after 1978, Jayatirtha became the Acharya of England. And I think his zone was also South Africa and some other places. And he got the designation Srila Jayatirtha Tirtha Pod. Now he got the name Tirtha Pod because Prabhupada had once said, Jayatirtha is my Tirtha. So this was conflated into Jayatirtha is the Tirtha of everyone in the world. He's, he's the Tirtha. Here's the Tirtha Pod. So each of these gurus had a Pod title. Bhakti Pod, Acharya Pod, Guru Pod, these kinds of Vishnu Pod, and so on. So he was Tirtha Pod. But the other gurus didn't really like him very much for the reason that he was a, a householder. They didn't like the householder group in general. Some of these big sannyasis like Tamal and Kirtananda and others, they, so they kind of made fun of Jai Tirtha. And there were some rumors that Jai Tirtha had had some fall down problems in Los Angeles before he got to England. I'm not sure about that, but that was the rumor, at least, that Jai Tirtha was not a very steady devotee in the first place. But on the other hand, I really liked Jai Tirtha because he was a gentlemanly type person. He was very friendly to me personally. And so when he started his guru thing, I started right away to wonder how long is this going to last? <laughs> you know, because I did have a feeling that Jai Tirtha was not a steady person. He wouldn't be able to handle all of this worship and glory and so on and so forth. Now, one thing is a lot of devotees don't even seem to know this or take this into account, but Srila Prabhupada had told us a number of times in India that we neophytes cannot absorb sins. We cannot be Diksha Gurus and absorb sins because if we do that, we will get sick or fall down or both. This will harm us. This will take us down. And so I was thinking right away, wait a minute, how can Jai Tirtha be taking the sins of thousands of people? This isn't going to work either because Prabhupada had predicted if they take sins, they will suffer. Now, when we were in India, I remember some ladies, two of the ISKCON ladies, were walking onto our Pandal program, and some little old ladies were touching their feet, and Prabhupada just stopped everything and went over and said, excuse me, but you cannot allow people to touch your feet. <laughs> so he just stopped everything and to warn these ladies, don't do this. You'll get sick. You'll fall down. You'll be taking karma. You can't do that. And he once told, uh, I think, Bahudak, you cannot give away beads. You have to sell the beads because if you give beads away, you're acting as a guru and you'll be getting some karma. Of course, I don't think they're getting all of the karma. I don't think Jai Tirtha got 100% of the karma of a person who became his disciple. I think those disciples still have a lot of karma left over, but they get some of their karma removed by accepting somebody like Jai Tirtha as their guru. Jai Tirtha takes some karma. Now, the most interesting thing that happened to me in relation to Jai Tirtha is that some years after he had been a guru, he was in San Francisco, I was in San Francisco, and just by chance, I went to Atreya Rishi's house, and Jai Tirtha was visiting at that time. At this time, he had his own, the Peace Krishna movement, which was selling a lot of drugs and things like that. <laughs> it was very out of control at that point. But anyway, Jai Tirtha was coming down the stairs, and it's a very narrow stairway, uh, which is typical in San Francisco houses. And me and Jai Tirtha passed one another in a very close situation. And when he passed by me, I felt my whole life breath just stopped. It's like somebody just punched me in the gut. I just couldn't breathe. And I felt kind of paralyzed even. And then, as I got further and further away from him, I started to recover. And I said to myself, what, what is that? That is, that is so strange. I get near this person, and I feel like my life air is being disturbed. And then I started thinking more and more about this. And I said, aha, that's right. Jai Tirtha is taking sins of many people. Many thousands of people have been touching his feet, washing his feet. He's been formally accepting their karma. He is surrounded with the, this karma. It's a big ball of karma that surrounds him. And that big ball of karma is on his subtle 
platform. And when I passed by him, that karma ball affected me. I was able to perceive that ball of karma around him. So this is one of the most important things that I probably learned from Jayatirtha, which is that Prabhupada was right. If we neophytes take the sins of others, we will become overwhelmed. And he clearly became overwhelmed in so many ways. Uh, unfortunately, that is why Prabhupada says false gurus go to the most obnoxious regions of the universe because they're taking all these sins with them. So I really didn't want to start out my whole story with Jayatirtha on this kind of sour note, but I think this is the most important thing that people should realize about what happened to Jayatirtha, because when you look at what happened, he, he got more and more and more, let's say, insane <laughs> as time went on. Starting in 1978, he just became more and more and more eccentric and off the rails and so on and so forth. And so did many of these other gurus. But I think that's the reason they went off the rails so much, or that's one of the reasons, is that they were accumulating all of this karma. And just like Prabhupada said, it can t take you down. And it did take them down. Of course, a number of them died prematurely as well, because if you get sick enough, it'll kill you. <laughs> so anyway, Jayatirtha, he comes back from India and in, in 1978, and he's now being worshipped in Bhaktivedanta Manor, which is at that time a big property that we had in England. And they put a seat for Jaitirtha, a Vyasasan seat, which was only a few inches smaller than Prabhupada's Vyasasan seat. So I said, wait a minute, Jaitirtha is now almost equal to Prabhupada. He's just two inches away from being Prabhupada. <laughs> How did that work? But I had a lot of objections. I said, for example, that Prabhupada had said we cannot offer boga to an impure person. It will not be accepted by Krishna. And right away they were offering boga to Jayatirtha. And I said, we, we can't be doing that. That's not going to work. Prabhupada personally told me we cannot offer boga to conditioned souls. We cannot offer uh, contaminated things as an offering to Krishna and so on because it won't be accepted by Krishna. It's not going to work. So I started saying things like that. I says, we can't offer boga to Jayatirtha. And this just didn't make me very popular because everybody else, I mean to say 99% of my god brothers and the new people, the new people were now being told that Jayatirtha is their guru, so they didn't want to hear any of my complaints. Not, no one thought that this was a serious problem. But unfortunately, this problem has never been resolved. Now, Jadarani later on told me the same thing. Yes, ISKCON has become the International Society for Boga Consciousness. That's what she told me. Because everybody's eating boga, because they're offering food to conditioned souls. And therefore, it's not accepted by Krishna. So this was a problem, another problem with the appointed gurus that now... People were offering boga to them, and they were offering their sins to them. And they were clearly not qualified to take these offerings, and they were not qualified to take these sins. So that was the first problem. But then I had some god brothers like Petit Pavana, Petit Udaran, I, I don't know which name he's using at present. But anyway, he, he was saying, oh no, Prabhupada wanted us to be gurus. He did. <laughs> well, maybe, you know. But didn't Prabhupada also say we couldn't absorb sin? So, we, in other words, yeah, you can be gurus at some point, maybe. But you have to be very careful to be actually qualified to take that position. And if you're not qualified, you will suffer, your followers will suffer, and so on and so forth. So, now at that time, the GBC had made Sridhar Maharaj the Shiksha Guru of ISKCON. And he was helping them write their papers and so on and so forth. So Jayatirtha became very f friendly with Sridhar Maharaj right away because Sridhar Maharaj was supporting Jayatirtha's position as Guru. So this went on later on. Jayatirtha, when he left ISKCON or was removed from ISKCON, I'm not sure how you describe it really, I think it was a mutual thing. He wanted to leave, and the G GBC no longer wanted him at some point. 
Then he went to take full shelter of Sridhar Maharaj. So Sridhar Maharaj was encouraging these neophyte people, yes, you can be gurus, yes, you can take karma, yes, you're as good as Jesus, you can absorb sins, yes, you can take the boga offerings, and all these kind of things. Because Sridhar Maharaj never understood that a person needs to be qualified before he can accept this post. <laughs> so Sridhar Maharaj told the GBC, you just wear the uniform of a guru and you become a guru, just like a person wears a military uniform and he becomes a military person. That's what Sridhar Maharaj said. But it doesn't really work that well <laughs> when a conditioned soul wears the dress of Jesus and wears a beard like Jesus. It, it does not make him Jesus. That just doesn't doesn't work. So this was a, a problem that the position of guru became very cheapened. And people thought, well, you know, anybody can just sit in this post, take this post, and wear the guru uniform and become a guru in this way. And Jayatirtha was saying things like that. He was saying, he was using some of Sridhar Maharaj's slogans. Well, yeah, we're just wearing the uniform, and the uniform will make us acharyas. <laughs> no, it won't. So anyway, gradually, gradually, Jai Tirtha's program got more and more, let's say, derailed. But first of all, he used to lecture that he had descended from the spiritual world, and so did his wife, and so did one other person named Rohini Nandan. He says, the three of us have descended from the spiritual world. And I says, well, wait a minute. <laughs> we have to be very careful about making statements like this. You know, I have descended from the spiritual world. You know, how are you going to back that up? It isn't isn't that very over the top to make such a claim. So what I realized from that is that Jayatirtha is himself starting to believe that he is the Messiah. He is the Messiah. He has descended from the spiritual world. He is as good as God. <laughs> uh, you know, he is he's a direct descendant of Vaikuntha Loka, which is. Of course, one of the qualifications of being an Acharya, you have to descend from the spiritual world. So Jayatirtha says, what's the problem? I've done that. But later on, and actually not even that later, problems started to happen. There were holes in his program. So rumors started circulating that he was taking drugs. In fact, the rumor was that he was offering LSD to his Shalagram deity, and he was smoking marijuana and this type of thing. So he went to India, supposedly he took some marijuana from some of these sadhus in Vrindavan. There's always some sadhus smoking marijuana in India. <laughs> so he apparently took some of that and became, let's say, affected, supposedly, you know, by that. Now, later on, the GBC had a meeting in London with all of us, and they said, well, Jaitirtha he was affected by these sadhus. These sadhus gave him some marijuana, and he became overwhelmed by that. So, of course, my question was, I said, well, wait a minute. The same sadhus offered me the same marijuana. I didn't take it. Does that make me more advanced than the acharya? <laughs> that was my question. And they said, well, we'll answer your question in private. We'll talk to you privately. Well, you know, actually, they, there never was going to be a private meeting. They they knew there's no answer for that question. So now another problem was that there was a photo of Jaitirtha, supposedly. You know, this was uh, the story I heard was that a lady disciple of his had wanted to get his darshan. He was in the bushes in the morning. There was some kind of a bushes behind the Bhaktivedanta Manor. And he was back there in the bushes in the morning. And so some woman wanted to take the photo of her guru who was supposed to be in samadhi in the bushes. <laughs> so eventually she convinces the guards, there was people patrolling around not letting anyone in, and she convinced them to let her in and she took a photo of Jaitirtha, but he was having sex, apparently, you know, with a, with a disciple. So then she gave that information to the temple president, who I think was Vichitra at the time. And uh, and he flew to Los Angeles to get the GBC to fix this problem. And what are we going to do? We can't have a guru who's having illicit sex, and he's probably or potentially or apparently offering LSD to his 
deity and this type of thing. What can we do? Now, in addition to that, Jai Tirtha's kirtans were getting more and more and more like just crazy. He was yelling, shouting, screaming in the Vyasasan. He would jump off the Vyasasan into the crowd like a, like a punk rock uh, musician. And the punk rock program was very big at the time and the punk rockers were famous. They would jump off the stage into the crowd. So Jai Tirtha was doing exactly that. But his singing was so off key and so out of whack and everybody knew there's a big problem and most people knew he's stoned. He's taking some kind of drugs. He's under the influence of drugs. He's sitting on a seat under the influence of drugs. So now we have two problems. There's an illicit sex problem, apparently, and there is a drug problem simultaneously. So he's become a full-blown Sahaja, this is what Prabhupada describes. The Sahajas, they take intoxicants, they have illicit sex, and they claim to be pure devotees at the same time. So I said, this is a full-blown Sahaja mess going on here. So what are we going to do? Well, you know, the GBC comes, Jai Pataka, Bhagavan, Ramachar, I think, and they say, well, you know, sometimes gurus fall down. That's what happens. Sometimes the guru has a problem. So they made Jai Tirtha a sannyasi, supposedly, at this meeting they had in Los Angeles with him, and they brought Jai Tirtha back, now dressed in orange. And they said, he's a sannyasi, he's been purified, he's been rectified, and he's good as new, and he's ready to go. He's, he's a pure devotee again. We've recertified him as a pure devotee. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> you mean to say that acharyas fall down, and then they have to be rectified, and they have to be monitored and censured and, you know, controlled by the GBC panel. How, how can a panel control the Acharya? Isn't the Acharya in touch with Krishna? Doesn't the Acharya dictate to the committee? The conditioned soul committee can't be in charge of the Acharya. It just doesn't make any sense. So I started asking questions like that. So needless to say, I was not very popular because I kept challenging things. Now, there was another aspect of this. The Jai Tirtha had his photo in the Guru Kula there at the manor, a big giant three-foot-high photo, just his head. It's a giant three-foot head. <laughs> so I had made an announcement that my children are never going to worship this guy as their guru. Now, one of the things that happened when the GBC Emergency Committee came to England, they they made a big announcement. They called everyone together and they said, all of Jai Tirtha's kirtan tapes have to be submitted to us. You have to hand them in. Uh, because they sounded so crazy and it was obvious he was uh, taking drugs while he was doing all the singing. So a lot of his followers had these tapes thinking these are divine leelas and they're wonderful. The ecstatic manifestations of Mahaprabhu <laughs> But even the GBC knew, no, these are just crazy sounding tapes. That's all they are. And they're evidence that our guru has gone off the rails. So we, we want to hide the evidence. So they made an announcement. Everybody has to submit their tapes of Jai Tirtha singing. And anyone caught with these tapes would be banned from ISKCON and removed from the temple immediately. So they were clamping down on, let's say, the evidence. The evidence that Jai Tirtha was going crazy. They didn't want that to be surfacing or rehashed or whatever. They just want, in other words, they wanted to cover everything up and move forward. Jai Tirtha has now been re-empowered. Now, if you go back to the beginning of all this, what they said was, at the very start, yes, our GBCs have been falling down all the time when Prabhupada was here. The GBC were having problems, left, right, and center. The GBC were deviating. The GBC were having illicit sex, some of them, and the GBC were blooping. But these 11 would never do that because they had been empowered by Prabhupada. So they had the Guru Shakti of Prabhupada now. So with this power now, they weren't going to fail. There wasn't going to be any future problems because they now had the Guru Shakti empowerment. Okay, wait a minute, but if Prabhupada could empower 11 people, why wouldn't he empower more of us? Why didn't he empower me or Prajumna or, you know, <laughs> and why would he empower Tamal, who he had all these problems? You know, he had to send them to China because of all the problems he was having with Tamal. So this didn't make a lot of sense. So Jai Tirtha was now re-empowered. How was he re-empowered? 
is the guru something like a light switch? You turn him on, he's empowered, and when the electricity runs out or there's a power shortage, the guru goes crazy, and then we have to re connect the wires and re-empower him. <laughs> None of this made any sense. Even now, it doesn't make sense. I mean, how does that make sense? But what this was a good lesson, though, for all of us. Now we realize they're just covering things up. But if you think about it, a lot of devotees were very arrogant at the time. Just very arrogant. They thought, we're going to do this. We're going to pull this trick off. We're going to keep Jayajirtha in the Guru's seat. We're going to keep him going. Many of my God brothers were very critical of me. They said, Pranjan, you shouldn't interfere. Jayajirtha is all recertified now. He's good as new. He's up and running. Yes, he was in a total car collision, but we took him to the junkyard. We found some new parts. We put him back together again. He's ready to go. <laughs> No, <laughs> I don't think so. So most of my God brothers were against me for saying we just have to remove Jajirtha. He's not qualified to be the Acharya of our religion. But people were very, again, ar arrogant. They thought we can do this. We're going to trick everybody, fool everybody, cheat everybody. We're going to have some foolish guy sitting in a big seat in our church, and no one's going to notice there's a problem. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not. Now, uh, what happened then is, Gradually, gradually, the the GBC realized I was just never going to accept this whole thing. You know, I'm, I'm just not going to go along with the program. So they had some kind of a meeting, and Judge Hirtha called me up, and he says, Pranjan, guess what? We have made you the guru of Ireland. Yes, you're the guru of Ireland. And we won't go to Ireland and mess with you. But one condition is you have to go along with our guru thing and don't mess with us and don't cause us any more headaches. <laughs> okay, well, wait a minute. Uh, I don't think so. I, you know, they just recertified a, a drug addict with pro probably a sex problem as the Acharya. Why would I want a certification from that kind of a party? Of course, then again, why would anybody want a certification from that kind of a party? I mean, later on, Bhakti Vika Swami, Prithu, uh, so many people became gurus under this boat of the committee, what, why would you want a certification from such foolish people? But now if you take an ordinary person, an ordinary guy walking down the street who is not arrogant, who's not foolish, and you say, look, we're going to put some foolish guy in your church. He's going to be taking drugs, maybe having sex on the side. Let's make him the Messiah of your religion. Well, how many people would go along with that? <laughs> I don't think many people would. So the devotees were arrogant. And they were foolish and they were fooled. But they wanted to be fooled. They wanted this whole thing to work. They wanted the Jayajirtha thing to work. And Sridhar Maharaj wanted it to work. And when Sridhar found out that some of us were protesting, he said none should protest. Anyway, to make a long story short, I got booted out of ISKCON. They said you got 24 hours to get off the property and you won't be on ISKCON property ever again for the rest of your life. You're out. So they made it they wanted to make an example of, of me that anyone who criticizes their Jai the program is going to be out, out the door, out the window, out the door, finished, going to be out of ISKCON. But I will give Jai to some credit. There was an incident where some mother in, in Bhagavan's zone, she just finally couldn't take it anymore. She was in Bhagavan's zone. Bhagavan's living high on the hog, you know, living like a king, riding around in a BMW, and she was having a problem at least she reported this problem, and I, I believe it's probably true. She couldn't get diapers for her baby, sanitary napkins for herself, this type of thing. So she took off with her baby to her mother's house. And then the father, who was a Prabhupada disciple, and some other guy came up. They beat up the mother, apparently. <laughs> that was reported in the newspapers, anyway. And they grabbed the baby and took, it back, took the baby back to Bhagavan's zone. Well, as soon as that happened, Jai Jirtha called me up and he says, Pranjan, you have to go to France and get this baby. Because by then it was in the newspapers, you know, kidnap baby and all the rest of it. So it was like a big disaster. So I went down there, got the baby, came back, and I didn't even have any problem going through the customs. Just sailed on through with the baby because I said, this is the baby. They said, oh, yeah, we know all about this baby because <laughs> it was in the newspaper. So, so Jai Jirtha was, I would say, mer merciful. More, he was more merciful, and he tried to help in these kind of situations. And there was another incident where a bunch of Bhagavan refugees were at the train station in Paris, 
And uh, he just left them there. They, they weren't going along with the Bhagavan thing, so he just booted them all out, you know, booted out women, children, babies, everything. And they didn't have any money, and they were at the train station. So Jayajita sent me down there with some money to help, you know, bail them out and this type of thing. So he was more merciful than the other. The other guys would just kick people out, kick them out the door with nothing, and you're out the door, you got no diapers, you got no baby food, you got no money. We don't give a crap, you're, you're gone, you're out. You're on the street. As soon as you don't bow down and worship us as the new messiahs of the land, you're, you're out. And I'm very surprised that many of my God brothers went along with this. I mean, this is like a horror show going on, and they're all telling me I shouldn't criticize. Don't criticize, Prabhu. Oh, you sh you're being offensive. You're being offensive to Prabhupada's senior people. Well, yeah, they're senior what? They're senior gangsters. <laughs> what they are. So anyway, that's kind of like the story of of Jayatirtha. But then it, it ends very sadly. He continues on. He, he starts a big drug operation. And eventually he's got this big thing called the Peace Krishnas. And they're, they're distributing the drug ecstasy all over the world, and especially in England. And one of his disciples, Navanita Chara, just says, you know what, Jayatirtha is Satan. That's what he is. <laughs> of course, you got to figure these guys are taking a lot of drugs and so on and so forth. So who knows what Navanita Chara is seeing or not seeing. But apparently Navanita Chara sees that there's a big demon surrounding Jayatirtha. Uh, maybe the, maybe he saw really who Jayatirtha is. <laughs> or maybe he saw all the sins that are surrounding Jayatirtha. Or, or maybe he was just stoned on uh, on drugs. We don't know. But anyway, he, he stabbed Jayatirtha, I think, 72 times and then chopped his head off. And then he was all covered with blood, and the police came in and said, what happened? And he said, my job is done, <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> and uh, the weird thing about this is that this Navanita Chara was, like 10 years later, he was walking down the street. A friend of mine saw him, and he said, how did you escape? And he says, I didn't escape. The government let me out because they think I did a favor of saving England from this crazy Jaitirtha guy. And he, he was distributing drugs all over England. They had no way to stop him, and I, I stopped him. I, I, I did a job, so they said I served Her Majesty's government really well. So after that, there was uh, big headlines all over Europe. Guru's head hacked off, so I wrote to the GBC, and I said, can you just at least tell people this guy was not a guru? <laughs> we can't leave this in the wind. You know, he's a guru, and his head was chopped up. No, he was not a guru. He was never a guru. Well, no, they're not going to say that. They're still saying he was a guru. He was a guru. He was a resident of Krishna Loka. Yes, he was. What? So it, it really showed me that there's just no, I mean, to say mercy from these people. And, and uh, there's no consideration of the word guru. They don't care what gets juxtaposed with guru. Well, is it sex, drugs, murder, mayhem? all kinds of crazy things, and uh, nobody cares. But to Jaitirtha's discredit, I would say his discredit, he was he was living like a king. He was another one of these guys. He had a big house, big car, big this, big that. And meanwhile, the Guru Kula children were reporting that they had insufficient food, insufficient blankets, insufficient medicine, all this kind of thing. So he was living it up. And so people, you know, parents were giving money to ISKCON thinking their children were going to be taken care of. And the money was being siphoned off so that these people could live like uh, Saudi princes, you know, with a big car, big house, servants, and all the rest of it. So that, I think, is a big problem. You know, he just didn't seem to care about the other citizens. What's happening to the Gurukula children? They're eating rotten, moldy oatmeal. You're living like a king, and you're an administrator. You're a leader. You're a guru. You're an authority. You are in charge of that. It's your responsibility to make sure that the citizens of the society that you're managing are being taken care of, and they aren't. So anyway, I think this just points the way. There's all kinds of other ins and outs to this story, but um, I think that's these are the most important points, or many of the most important points. And lastly, I would like to say there are people who said that after 1976, in, in the Gopi Baba incident that I left ISKCON, I blooped and I was gone. Nope. I was there in England. How could I have driven down to get this baby in France under Jai Tirtha's direction? And my uh, story was in the newspapers and all the rest of it. That we, you know, my picture was in the newspaper in England that I went to rescue the baby. So <laughs> that wouldn't have happened though. I was bloop and gone from ISKCON. I was still very much in there. 
and part of the process. Now, in the book Monkey on a Stick, it says that Jai Tirtha was in Nepal and some devotee, a disciple of his, came there to complain. And Jai Tirtha took this guy out on a boat and uh, the guy was apparently tossed off the boat in the middle of a frozen lake and his body was found later with his, hand, his fingers and hands all smashed up looking like he had tried to grab his way onto a boat. <laughs> so, did Jai Tirtha orchestrate this murder? Some people have asked me that. Do I think he was capable of actually executing or ordering an execution? Uh, hard to say, but I do know that when I was at Berkeley Temple and his crowd came there, I was standing in front of the temple uh, and a, a bunch of his people came, like 500 people, a huge crowd. He had a huge crowd of people the Peace Krishnas, and they started yelling. They says, there's Pranjan, let's get him, let's get him, let's let's break his neck. Uh, you know, they came there, and when they saw me, they were going to kill me, I guess. Now, a couple of Hansaduta disciples were outside as well, outside the temple, and so one of them ran into the temple, and there was a small group of people in the temple. They were having a kirtan, so he, he rang the bell, the temple bell, and he says, everybody outside. So there was maybe... Ten Hansaduta people outside, they came out to confront the Jayatirtha people. So the Hansaduta people said, hey, guess what? There's only ten of us, there's a couple hundred of you, but we have the guns. You know, so Hansaduta's people, they carried guns. <laughs> so needless to say, you know, the Jayatirtha people had to, had to uh, retreat. But... I do believe I could have been killed right there on the spot. So I, I, I do believe that Jai Tirtha did go that crazy. At the end, he could have had people killed, could have had me killed or anybody killed because he, he just went nuts. So, um, but the, there's one other thing people don't realize that Jai Tirtha is probably the, the most advanced of all of them because Professor Sanyal, uh, he supported... Anantabhasadeva in 1936. He and Sridhar Maharaj and Madhav Maharaj, they made a false Acharya. Now, mysteriously, Professor Sanyal died a couple of years after this whole thing started. And Prabhupada says he was killed by Krishna. And he was killed because making false gurus is very offensive. And so Krishna saved him from this offense by killing him. So if you think about it, Jayatirtha was one of the first people to go. <laughs> from this group, uh, and just like Professor Sanyal. So Prabhupada says that Professor Sanyal was very dear to Krishna. He was more dear to Krishna than the other guys. So he was more dear to Krishna than Sridhar Maharaj and Madhav Maharaj, because they went on to support false gurus. Uh, in fact, Sridhar Maharaj became a big cheerleader of the whole GBC false guru program, so he never learned. You know, and uh, so, but the person who was killed is more dear, that means the person who was more dear would be Jai Tirtha <laughs> to save them from offenses because these type of offenses can take a person into millions of years of staying in the material world, rotting here forever. So if those offenses can be cut back and curbed, that's very good. Anyway, I hope this has all been very informative for people. Haribo.